Well, good morning, everyone. I want to ask you to stand as we just celebrate. We're so thankful today to be able to regather, to be able to worship the Lord in this place. And let's just pray before we worship Him together. Father, we thank you for this day. We have been counting down the days to be able to worship you with our brothers and with our sisters. And Lord, we give this time to you. We pray that you would be exalted. Lord, that you would be glorified by the praises of your people in this place today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord together. There's a reason I can see. There's a reason for this life inside me. One name above all names. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. There's a reason for this hope. There's a reason for this peace that I know. One worthy of all praise. Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus. I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice high. Shout of your love till the day that I die. Everything that I have, all my worship I bring. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. You're the reason I live. You're the reason I sing. For the victory. of your grace each day. I will bow and bless your name. Jesus, I thank you, Jesus. I will lift my hands up. I will raise my voice high. I will shout of your love till the day that I die. Everything that I have, all my worship, my gathering here in this place or online or wherever we are today gathering 
in the name of Jesus. It is his grace that has been shown to us, his grace that is poured out on us. And we are glad. We are thankful. We are a people filled with the goodness of God. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. Let's sing it together. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom he paid for me. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, sing it. Oh, your grace, so free. Oh, Good morning, and good morning to our online friends. If you're a guest today, then thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm so thrilled you're here, so thrilled that I feel like singing to you right now. But due to time constraints and your safety, I will refrain today. But if you would like to connect with us, then go to our website, fbcmail.info backslash connect and fill out that card for us and we will uh, connect with you. 
Well, the greeting uh, today, a, a little bit different, no handshakes, uh, no hugs today, but I got a couple options for you. Uh, number one, you see behind me here, the, the Vulcan greeting by our good friend Spock, right back in the, in the 60s, early 70s. Yeah, long live and prosper, right? It actually <laughs> means, it's kind of cool, I was looking at it, it actually means uh, it's a Hebrew letter. Yeah, Hebrew letter. Yeah, it's the first letter in Shaddai. Anyway, second, <laughs> your second option today, David Hasselhoff, right, with the finger pointing that he made popular in the 80s or 90s, so there's another option for you. And then we always have one of my favorites <clears throat> from Happy Days. You remember Fonzie, right? Hey. So there you go. Have some fun with the greeting today. There's some of your options, and there's plenty more. But have fun with the greeting today. Let's go ahead and do that. While you're greeting... Our groups are still, are, are actually have started meeting through Zoom and a number of uh, uh, home meetings, but we are now opening the church. It's just a reopening the church to have our groups back this week. So if your group would like to have a classroom, then please go ahead and reserve that by just calling the church office. We have a number of groups that have already RSVP, so please get your RSVP into our church office. That's 321-723-0561. All right, let's go ahead and continue with our worship. An old hymn text has been reset for us, and we've been singing it here for quite a while. It talks about Jesus being the cornerstone of our faith, that our faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing it together as we worship.
church family, even in the midst of our excitement and our thanksgiving today about being able to regather with one another and worship the Lord together. I know we're also mindful today, all of us, of what's going on across our nation, uh, the strife and the unrest that we've been witnessing over the past few weeks. And so I want us to take time, even on this first day back together of worshiping, just to take time to pray. And so I want to invite you, whether you're in the room this morning, whether you're watching online, if you would just kneel with me wherever you are, let's take time to pray together for our nation. I want to give us a few areas to pray about together today. Give us some time to pray for each one. But first, let's pray for justice. We have seen in our nation so many instances of of injustice. We know we serve a God who is a God of justice. And so even now, let's pray to him. Let's bring our burdens to him about the injustices that we have seen and ask him to intervene. Another word I want to put in front of you to pray about is the word peace. In our nation right now, there is no peace. We see conflict on every side. So let's pray to our God, who is a God of peace. Ask him to bring peace to our nation even now. final word to pray about today, the word hope. When we look across our nation, we see so many without hope. We know that our hope is only found in you. Father, we come to you now and we pray for hope for those who are hopeless. Father, even though we know that all things will not be made right, that all will not be just until your just King, our Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ, is ruling and reigning over this world. Father, even as we know that, your Son taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We long, Father, today to see your will done on earth. And Father, we don't see that right now. Father, we long to see peace. We long to see our neighbors of every race and every tribe and every tongue coming to know the peace that is only found in you, the hope that is only found in you. Father, would you use us? Would you Raise up your church, both here and around the world, to be peacemakers, to be those who give a message of hope, to be those who love with a radical love in the way that you have loved us. Lord, we bring these prayers to you today, knowing that you hear us knowing that you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Maranatha, even so, come, Lord Jesus. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Our scripture reading today is found in 1 Thessalonians 2.17 through 3.13. Verse 17, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown of, for rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good, noise, good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you? For all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. If you have your Bibles today, church, and I hope you do, would you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? Uh, you know, it feels kind of strange standing here at this uh, pulpit after all this time. Now, back in March, when we first started doing our services online, uh, and I had to preach sitting down with a TV uh, behind me, uh, and, and literally only like three people in the whole room, that felt kind of strange. Uh, but you know, after uh, having done that for all of this time, now, now this feels strange uh, again, to be here at this pulpit and to see you here this morning. Uh, but I am sure that I will get used to this again, and I much prefer it. I want you to know that because, church family, I have missed you so much and have been counting down the days to be able to worship in person again, just as I know you have as well. Before we turn to God's word together this morning, let's turn to him in prayer. 
Father, we thank you for this time together in your presence with your word before us. And Father, we need today to hear a word from you, our Father and our God and our King. And so, Lord, would you speak to us now? Would you give us the ears to hear what you want to say to every one of us? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are taking a break today from our study in the book of Acts just for this one week. Because I really believe that the Lord has led me today to bring a special message on this day. Because, you know, really this day is actually a historic day in the history of our church. Uh, Like I shared last Sunday night at our outdoor service, uh, in the eight and a half years that I have been blessed to serve as your pastor, uh, we have only had two Sundays where we were not able to meet for corporate worship. And both of those were because of hurricanes. You know, up north, uh, sometimes uh, they're not able to meet for church because of snow days. Uh, Well, here in Florida, you know as well as I do, sometimes we can't meet because of hurricane days. We're praying we won't have any of those this year in 2020. Uh, But that's it. In eight and a half years, only two Sundays that we weren't able to meet for worship. But this year, uh, we have gone 11 Sundays in a row without being able to worship together in this place. And and again, like I shared last week, I'm quite confident that in the 99-year history of our church, we have never gone 11 Sundays in a row without being able to worship together. And so today is our first day back after our longest time apart ever in the history of our church. And so this day is special. And again, I want to bring you a special message today from a passage that I believe the Lord has led me to that speaks so clearly to right where we are today as a church. The Bible passage that was read for us from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, uh, again, meets us right where we are. And I want you to see with me today in this passage, one praise that we should all be praising the Lord for today, but also three prayer requests uh, that we need to be praying today and lifting up to the Father. So first of all, the praise. And church, let's praise the Lord for our regathering. Let's praise him. Let's thank him today that after all this time, we can regather with our church family again. You know, if the Apostle Paul were here today, if he wasn't with the Lord in heaven, and if he could be here with us today, I I believe that he would be saying the same thing, that we should be praising and thanking the Lord that we can gather again in this place for worship. And the reason I say that is because over and over in this passage that he wrote to the Thessalonians, he tells them how he was longing to meet with them again and to see their face. A little bit of background before we dive in here. Uh, The Apostle Paul planted, he started this church in the city of Thessalonica when he was on his second missionary journey. You can find the story in Acts chapter 17, so eventually we will get there as we progress through our study of the book of Acts. But in a nutshell, what happened was this. He came into the town with his missionary team. For three Sundays, he preached the gospel in the synagogue to the Jews who lived in that city. Then he spent some time sharing the gospel to the Gentiles who were there. Uh, Some people believed a church uh, was formed. But then, as happened to Paul in many of the places where he went, uh, some of the Jewish folks who did not believe in his message were furious with the Apostle Paul and drove him out of town. He had to leave town by cover of nightfall and go to the next city. And now it has been some time since Paul has been able to see these precious believers again. And apparently Paul had some detractors there in the city of Thessalonica who were telling people in this church, well, you know, Paul doesn't care about you. That's why Paul hasn't come back to see you again. He, he doesn't care. He's not coming back. He's abandoned you. And Paul wanted them to know that that wasn't the case at all. Listen to what he said in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 again. He said, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. 
So in verse 17, Paul is emphasizing that uh, they only left this church in the first place against their will, that it wasn't what they wanted to do. And in fact, what he says there, having been taken away from you, uh, that word to be taken away is literally a word that means to be orphaned. In other words, Paul felt like a father uh, that had had his children stripped away from him. And he wanted them to know that that's how he felt about them. He wanted them to know that he had tried actually many times to come back and, and visit with them again. But he says that Satan hindered him or put roadblocks in his way. Now, we don't know exactly what roadblocks or hindrances Satan used. And Paul doesn't state that here. But, but regardless, Paul wanted them to know how badly he wanted to come and see them again. That's why in chapter 3, in verse 1, uh, Paul basically says, when, when we just couldn't take it anymore, when we, when we just had to know how you were doing, uh, we decided to send Timothy to you. Presumably, Paul and his partner in the ministry, Silas, stayed in the city of Athens, where they were at that time. But they decided to send Timothy to the city of Thessalonica to check on these believers and to encourage them in their faith. And by the time that Paul has written this letter, Timothy has already gone to the city of Thessalonica, and now he has come back with a report, and it was a good report. It was a report about how these believers were standing firm in their faith despite the persecutions that they were enduring. And so we'll talk more about this later, but Paul was overjoyed by that news. He was elated by that news, and yet he still eagerly wanted to go and see these believers again. Look at what he says in chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, "...night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face." And perfect what is lacking in your faith. And then he prays this. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. So he was praying night and day for God to make a way. For him to be able to come and to see these believers again face to face. Regathering with this church was a passion in the heart of the Apostle Paul. And maybe you say, well, you know, what's the point? You know, well, why does that matter that this man who lived 2,000 years ago wanted to see some other people that lived 2,000 years ago? What does that have to do with me? Well, well, I think what it has to do is this, is if the Apostle Paul wanted that badly to reconnect with this church in Thessalonica that he had spent a relatively short amount of time with to begin with, if he wanted to see them that badly, then how much should it mean to us to be able to see each other's face again in our church in this place? We should be overjoyed today that we get to see one another again. You know, I know a lot of people have uh, been growing out their beard during this uh, time. Uh, they've been calling it their quarantine beard or their coronavirus beard. I guess I got a head start on, on that. Of course, I've always grown a beard to try to take the attention off the top of my head. But, but I know some people have grown their beards out during this time. One, one person I know that's done that is my father-in-law, Mark Matheny. And he said right when this whole thing started, he started growing out his beard. And, and he said to me, I, I'm not going to shave this beard until we're able to have church again. And I think after a little while, he started regretting that decision. He didn't know it was going to go three months, and it was really itching him. And so it just cracked me up last Sunday night, about 30 minutes after our outdoor service that we had. I went back to my house, and, and there was my wife uh, helping to trim uh, my father-in-law's beard off. And I laughed, and I said, well, that didn't take you long to, to shave that off. And he was ready uh, to get rid of that beard. But, but I love that he did that, and I love what he said about it. Because he didn't say when this first started and he started growing that beard out, he didn't say, I'm going to grow this out until the stores reopen. He didn't say, I'm going to grow this out until I can go back to my favorite restaurant again. He didn't say, I'm going to grow out this beard until I can watch sports on TV again. No, he said, I'm going to grow this out until I can see my church again. And he had a passion to be able to reconnect with you. A passion that I know is in my heart, a passion that I believe is in your heart. To be able to worship again together brings such joy to each and every one of our hearts. Now with that said, I know we've been so blessed to be able to see many faces today of our church family. But of course we haven't seen all of those faces yet, have we? 
There are still hundreds of our church family who are watching today on our iCampus. Uh, I know uh, there are some of our younger families who have shared with me that they're going to wait another couple of weeks and come back once our preschool opens again. Uh, I know that there's others in our church who, because of their age or because of health concerns, are going to wait perhaps another few weeks or a month or longer until it's safe for them to be able to uh, come and join us for worship again. And so for some in our church family, the joy that we feel today is a joy that they're going to feel uh, another Sunday, Sometime this summer when they're able to reconnect and see all of our faces again. But until that happens, until we're able to see the face of every one of our church family, let's keep our church family in our prayers. Let's ask that God would hold us close to himself during this time. I said earlier that we had one praise today, and we've already seen that praise, to praise God for our regathering. But also I said we have three prayer requests in this passage Three prayers that we need to be praying together. And here's the first prayer request that I want to share with you. Let's pray to God and say, Lord, we pray that you would reestablish our faith. That as we regather in this place, God, would you reestablish our faith? Now, all three of the prayer requests that we're going to look at uh, come from the final few verses in this passage where Paul is actually praying for uh, the people who are in this church. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Again, Paul writes, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. It's clear that the faith of the Thessalonian believers was front and center in Paul's mind. In fact, five times in the first ten verses of chapter 3, you'll find the word faith. Remember, these were brand new Christians that Paul had to leave shortly after they came to faith in Christ. He wasn't able to disciple them. He wasn't able to give them the the fundamentals of the faith as he normally would have been able to do. And, And so that's why he's praying night and day to be able to see them again, because he says, I want to come so that I can perfect what's lacking in your faith. The word perfect there is a word that means to supply. It was a word that fishermen used to talk about patching up the holes that were in their nets. That's what Paul wants to do. He wants to help repair the holes or the gaps uh, that was in the faith of these believers. The reality is, of course, we all have gaps, don't we, in our understanding of the Lord. None of us have arrived at a place where we have a perfect understanding of all things. None of us have arrived at a place where we perfectly live out even the things that we do understand. That's why all of us need to be discipled. All of us need to be strengthened in our faith. And we need the church, we need one another to help disciple us to maturity. And so as we're able to regather with our church family, we should be praying, Lord, Reestablish me, reestablish my family in our faith. From wherever we are right now, from wherever I'm starting today, Lord, would you grow me? Would you strengthen me so that I might be stronger in my faith? Again, part of why Paul was so concerned about them is how young they were in the faith. Uh, That's why he says he sent Timothy to them to check on them, to help strengthen them. If you look back in chapter 3, verse 2, he writes, We sent Timothy, our beloved brother and minister of God, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So he wants to establish them, he wants to strengthen them. But also he wanted Timothy to encourage them. This was a church that was going through an intense time of persecution. The same persecution that drove Paul out of town had not abated. They were still dealing with that, still facing that. And so he wanted to encourage them to press on in their faith. But also in verse 5, he wants to remind them that there is always a spiritual battle that is taking place. Look with me at verse 5. He says, For this reason, when I can no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Earlier he had talked about how Satan had been an adversary that was preventing Paul from being able to come and visit them. Now he speaks about Satan as that tempter who was tempting these believers to abandon their 
faith. And he wants them to know that this battle is taking place. In writing about this passage centuries ago, John Calvin said that Christians would do well to always remember that Satan is doing everything he can to hinder the strengthening of the church. And we need to remember that today. Satan wasn't just working against the church 2,000 years ago. Satan is still working against God's church today. While God wants to build up our faith, Satan wants to erode our faith, and if it were possible, to tear our faith down to the ground. You know, when you think about that, about that how Satan wants to use every situation he can to weaken our faith, I think we have to recognize that what we've been going through in these days with this coronavirus and the inability to be able to meet together with other believers that this time has provided a unique opportunity for Satan to tempt God's church in a variety of ways. And during these days, I believe Satan wants to use this time of seclusion and isolation from one another that we have gone through to tempt us to discouragement and despair, particularly for those who already wrestle with depression and anxiety. During these days, he wants to tempt us to laziness, to purposelessness. He wants to tempt us towards impurity or to giving in to various addictions. During this time in general, he wants to tempt us to slowly drift away from our faith, to drift away from the Lord and to drift away from his people, the church. I think that's one of my main concerns for our church family during these days is that for some, these months of not meeting together with our church family would become a habit. And even after the coronavirus is long past us, my concern is that there would be some in our church who would still not ever reconnect or reattach themselves with the bride of Christ, with the church. Now, to do that not only would be to disobey God's command to assemble together with other believers, but also it would be to give in to Satan's temptations. Because Satan knows that corporate worship with God's people is one of the means of grace that God has given us to hold us fast to him and to strengthen us in our faith. And so let's pray for our church family that God, who is greater than he that is in the world, would reestablish all of us in our faith. Secondly, let's pray for this. Let's pray that the Lord would refocus our hope. Refocus our hope. Listen again to Paul's beautiful prayer that he prays for these believers in verses 11 to 13 of chapter 3. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So if you look at verse 13 with me, I want to focus there for just a moment. Actually, Paul doesn't use the word hope in verse 13. He's really writing about their holiness. He's praying that they would be blameless in holiness when the Lord Jesus returns for his church. You know what the Bible teaches us about holiness is that on our own, none of us are holy. That all of us have sinned against God, that we're sinners, that we're unholy, but that God is holy. But that God loved us so much, he sent his one and only son who went to the cross and paid for our sin and paid for our unholiness. And that when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus, God takes our sin from us and forgives us of our sin. And he gives us the holiness of Christ. And from that moment on that God looks at us and sees us as being perfectly holy just as Jesus is holy. What a wonderful truth that is. And yet we know as believers that this side of heaven, none of us lives with a perfect holiness every day. We all stumble, we all fall in many, many ways. And yet as we walk with Christ, the longer we walk with Christ, the Bible says we should be growing in our holiness. And one day when we see the Lord face to face, we will be holy just like he is holy. And that's the hope. 
that Paul is putting in front of these believers in this verse. He, he's speaking about that day when at the Lord's coming, we will be holy like he is holy when we see the Lord. And I, and I don't know about you, but that does give me hope to know that one day my struggle against sin will be over. That one day I will be made to be just like Jesus. That gives me a great deal of hope. You know, one of the neat things in this letter is that at the end of all five chapters, the Apostle Paul says something about the return of Christ. And we won't go through it right now, but if you look through all five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, somewhere in those final verses of each chapter, you'll see a word about the return of Jesus. If you look at the end of chapter 5, towards the very end of this book, This is what he writes in verses 23 and 24. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it. The church, let's refocus our hope on that day and on that promise that when Jesus comes, he has promised to sanctify, to purify his church completely and entirely. And let's allow that knowledge that one day we will be with our holy God and with his holy ones. Let's allow that knowledge to drive us, to spur us on, to live a holy life that looks different than the world around us. You know, when we think about refocusing our hope, there's another place in this passage where Paul speaks about his hope, and that's at the end of chapter 2. Look at verses 19 and 20 with me in chapter 2. He says, For what is our hope? Or joy or crown of rejoicing, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. So again, here we are at the end of a chapter, and he's pointing again to the return of Christ. And and in speaking about that, he's picturing that moment when we as believers will stand before the Lord and receive the rewards on that day before him. And as Paul looks ahead to the future, And he looks ahead to standing before the Lord. He also looks and and he's excited about the fact that the Thessalonians who have heard his message, who have trusted in Jesus, will be standing there too before the Lord. And he says, on that day, you will be my joy. You will be my hope. You will be my crown. Now, to be sure, Paul is not taking credit here for the salvation of these People, if you've read any of Paul's letters, you know that Paul knows that salvation is by God and by God alone. But Paul also knows that God speaks and uses his ambassadors to share his message with this lost world. So he's rejoicing at that knowledge that one day he'll be able to stand before the Lord. And he says, on that day, you will be my joy. You will be my hope. You will be my crown. You know, all of this just reminds me that we need to focus in this life on what really matters. And what really matters is people and where they stand with Jesus. That's what's going to matter when our life comes to an end. It's not going to matter how big our houses are. It's not going to matter how much money we have in our bank account or how many people know our name. What's going to matter on that day? Number one, do we know Jesus? And number two, if we do know him, how have we lived for him? How have we served him? How have we told others about him? Paul said these Christians on that day that he introduced to Jesus would be his hope and his joy Friend, let me ask you, do you have some other hope and joy other than that? Because if so, God wants to refocus your hope and my hope. Like our church's mission statement says, we exist to make disciples here and everywhere for the glory of God. And you know, when you live like that, with, with that focus, when we, when we live to obey Christ's commands to go and make disciples, then just like Paul, other disciples will be our hope and our joy and our crown. So let's pray as we regather today that God would reestablish our faith, that God would refocus uh, our hope. And then finally, let's pray that God would rekindle our love. You know, as I studied these words this week that Paul wrote to this ancient church, I think that's what overwhelmed me 
the most was just how much Paul loved the people of this church. That's why he was so distressed that he wasn't able to go and to see them. It's why he was so anxious to hear back from Timothy about how they were doing. That's why in verses 7 through 9, he was so relieved to hear that report from Timothy about how they were standing strong in their faith. But but I think the line that stood out to me the most about how much Paul loved this church is there in verse 8 of chapter 3 when he says this, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Wow, I mean, what, what he's saying there is it doesn't really matter what's happening to me. In the verse before that, you can see Paul was having a hard time too. Paul was going through his own persecutions and and sufferings. And yet he said, none of that matters. It doesn't matter what's happening to me as long as you are standing firm in the Lord. If you're staying close to Jesus, if you're still growing in your walk with Jesus, then that's all that matters to me. I'm good as long as you're good with the Lord. That was his mindset, his attitude. Wow. You know, church, God wants us to love one another like that. He wants us to care that much about the faith of our brothers and our sisters in our church. And you know, this is probably a good kind of gut check time for us. Because we're only going to feel that way. We're only going to care that much about the faith of our brothers and our sisters If we view the church the way that Paul did, if we view the church the way that the Lord does as a family, a spiritual family, but if we view the church like most of America does today, if we view the church like it's a product that we come and consume or or like it's an event or a concert that we attend, if we view the church as it's a place that I go for my own enjoyment or my own entertainment or even my own personal individual growth, if that's the way that we view the church, then what Paul is saying here when he says, I live as long as you stand firm in the Lord, that will sound like a foreign language to us. It'll sound like a foreign concept that we can't relate to because here's the truth that I want you to see. If you just go to church, then what happens to the church won't concern you very much. But if you are the church, then your life will be wrapped up with all of ours. You'll care about the faith of your church family because you love them. You know, I I believe that I love the the big C church made up of believers all over the world. I believe with all my heart that I love this local church as well. But, you know, just reading these words from Paul was still convicting to me. As I read about how much he loved them, how much he cared about their faith, it just made me stop and pray, Lord, would you rekindle my love for your church, that I would love your church more than I ever have before. Again, they were already a loving church. Timothy came back and told Paul about their love. And yet, even so, listen to what Paul prays for them in chapter 3, verse 12. He says, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. The, the words increase and abound there mean to have a super abundance of love. And you know, no matter how much you love right now, that you can always love more. And we should pray that for one another, that our capacity to love would increase. Notice Paul says this love that he was praying for them about was a love expressed not only to one another, but then he says, and to all. Those words to all mean to those who are outside the church, people in the community around them who at that time did not know Jesus. It would have even included the very people who were persecuting them every single day. You know, when I look at what is happening in our country right now, when I look at all of the unrest, all of the anger, all of the injustice, all of the finger pointing, all of the hatred, you know, it is well past time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to rise up and love people who are outside the church the way that Jesus loves. Like it says here, we need to show love to one another and to all. To all means people who look differently than us. 
It means people who have a different skin color than we have. It means people who vote differently than we do. It means people who think differently than we do. It even means people who reject every single thing that we know and believe. We love like that because our Savior called us to love even our enemies. And in case we need a reminder today of what real biblical love looks like, we'll never find a better description of love than the one that Paul gave us in his letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 13, listen to these words. He said, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Oh, how our world today needs the church to love them like this. We've asked God today to do three things in our church. To reestablish our faith. To refocus our hope. And to rekindle our love. At the very end of that chapter where we just read that description of love, Paul writes about all three of those things. Here's what he said. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. Church, I want to ask you to stand with me, if you would. Maybe there is someone here today who needs to come right now, needs to put their hope and their faith in the one who is love, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who went to the cross and died for all of our sin and rose again on the third day. The one who proved forever beyond a shadow of a doubt that our God loves us. Maybe you need to come today and put your faith in him as Savior and Lord. For those who are watching even right now online, you can call out to God even from right where you are. Ask him to save you. Ask him to forgive you, to come into your life and to make you new. And you can let us know about that decision by going to this website that's on the screen in front of you. We'd love to follow up with you, just rejoice with you about what God has done in your life. But you know, mainly today, this message has been for the church. This message has been for those in this place who who are already followers of Jesus Christ. I don't know what God has been doing in your life over these past few months. And maybe God has been wanting to use this time with this coronavirus as a wake-up call spiritually in your life. To stop you in your tracks. To bring you back to him. Maybe before all of this started, you were drifting in your walk with the Lord. He wants to call you back. And so right now on this Sunday as we regather in this place. What a great Sunday for you to come and just kneel here at this altar and recommit and rededicate your life to the Lord. Maybe he's speaking to you about one of these areas specifically that we've been talking about. He's calling you to come and and ask him to reestablish your faith. He's asking you to come and pray that he would give you hope that you haven't had in these days. Maybe you're needing to call out to the Lord for him to give you love. For all people. As we sing this song together, you come, you kneel here before the Lord, just you and the Lord, and you meet with Him as we sing together. And we lift our eyes to heaven 
We wrap our lives around your life. We lift our eyes to heaven, to you. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center. What a special day it has been to worship together with you, church family, in this place. Again, I want to thank those joining us on our iCampus today and joining in and worship that way. And we look forward to when we'll be able to see you and worship together in person with you uh, very soon. Uh, but just a couple announcements before we go. For some of you, it may have been your first time on the church campus in three months. And so maybe as you walked in today, you had a chance to see the uh, containers out by our main interest, uh, entrance where we've been collecting food for these past uh, several months. And uh, thank you again, church family, for giving so generously towards that ministry. And again, as you continue to, uh, to bring in those items, we'll continue to pass those out to our community uh, to be able to love them. Uh, pray for tonight. Uh, we've been doing this each Sunday night. And so again, tonight from 5 to 6.30, we expect to have many, many folks from our community here. So keep that ministry in your prayers, if you would. Uh, also, just to avoid uh, passing the offering plates in our service, we will uh, be giving today just as we go out the doors. And so you uh, just look for the ushers at the doors as you go out. Also, of course, you can continue to give online at fbcmail.info as well. And uh, thank you just for your faithfulness to give to the Lord, give to the ministry of the Lord in this place, even during this time where we haven't been able to meet together. And, uh, and so thank you for worshiping with us today. I pray that you would have a great week this week on mission with King Jesus.